Father, being the one who knows our needs before we even knew we had a need. Thank you that you desire for us to have a relationship with you, a living and a true and close relationship. Father, I pray even this morning, that even now, that you would uh, just come here, uh, speak to us, uh, speak through me, oh God, that I might speak to your people, oh God, and that we might receive from you uh, what you have to say, oh God, and that we might be forever changed, having uh, been in your presence, oh God, and having heard your word, and having heard, heard you speak. Thank you, Jesus, for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name we thank you. Amen. Amen. Our passage this morning, our scripture passage this morning is from the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 1 through 18. And I'm not reading the whole chapter, but I'm going to, I'm talking about the encounter of three people who had a relationship with Jesus. It's the time of the year when we hear about the resurrection. Of course, it's Easter. And we hear that, well, Jesus died on the cross on Good Friday, and then on Sunday morning, we hear that Jesus rose. So, what's the big, what's the big deal? What's the relevance of that to us? So we hear that, we see movies about it, we read the stories in the Bible, but what is the relevance to us? And I thought about that question for as, myself as well. So what that Jesus rose from the grave? What does that mean to us? What in practical terms does that mean to us? And I often wondered about that as a young adult, and only has God shown me like, what that really truly means in relevance to me in my life even now. And it meant a relationship with the true and living God. Think about ourselves. Think about how, in your own life. Have you ever thought about what is the relevance of Jesus' death, but also his resurrection in your life. What does that mean? What does that mean for me in my own life? How does that come home to me in my own life? And today we're going to look at that. We're going to look at that again from three perspectives. We're going to look at it from Mary's perspective, that's Mary Magdalene. And then we're going to look at it from Peter and John. And then, um, and then we're going to go even further and then we're going to go, and Mary has another encounter, another perspective that she had. She had an initial perspective, and then she has a second perspective once she sees and encounters the risen Christ. Uh, so let's look at our scripture passage, and it's in the Gospel of John, chapter 20, starting in verse 1. Mary's, Mary Magdalene's reaction. Now, Mary Magdalene, as we know, some of the... Uh, we well, as we know, the history behind Mary was is that she, um, as history tells us, it doesn't say clearly in the scripture that it was her, but history tells us that Mary Magdalene was the very the one who Jesus had saved from those who wanted to condemn her. She was a known prostitute, an adulteress at the time, and she. Uh, the religious leaders were jealous of Jesus. They wanted Jesus to condemn this woman, but they wanted to see what Jesus was going to do uh, with this woman. So they brought her, they put her in the midst, and the, the, the crime for an adulteress was stoning. So here were the religious leaders coming to look to condemn Jesus to see how he would do it, and they had stones in hand, and then Jesus takes this woman, and she says... Um, if any one of you is without sin, let him cast the first stone. He writes on the ground, and then he says, and if any one of you is without sin. And then one by one, they go away, because none of them were guiltless. None of them all had sinned. Just because they weren't a, maybe necessarily an adulterer or an adulteress doesn't mean that they didn't have sin. And that's the point that Jesus was trying to get at. But Jesus showed mercy to this woman because she looked for mercy. And then Mary became, she became a, a, a very close follower of Jesus. She was one of his faithful supporters, uh, following him in his ministry and helping him with his ministry. So Mary Magdalene was one that was very close in helping Jesus throughout his ministry time while he was here on earth. 
and so she was very close, and there was, there was a strong bond there for her with Jesus. And so um, as she goes on here, Mary, here it is that Jesus, now we'll go back, let's fast forward to the time of the resurrection. Here Jesus had died. Jesus was crucified on that Friday, and now and here it is Sunday morning. It's after, it's after the Sabbath, so the Jews could go and they could, uh, and they they were free to go and do things where they couldn't do things on the Sabbath. But now they were free to go. The first thing before it was dark, while it was still dark, it says here in verse one, Mary went to the tomb. Mary went to the tomb. She couldn't wait. As soon as the Sabbath was over, she couldn't. She went, and the first thing she did, what did she want to do? She wanted to go to be where Jesus was. Because that's where her heart was. Her, she, Jesus had shown her affection. Jesus had shown her forgiveness when she was standing there in the midst of people who were trying to accuse her. And she became close with Jesus. And now that Jesus is gone, he's in a tomb, the one thing that she wanted to do was to give him a proper burial. She wanted, she brought spices so that she could put him on his body, so she could have a proper burial. And so that was her heart. That's where she stood with Jesus. And so she rides on the first day of the week. She sees the stone rolled away from the tomb. And what's the first thing you do in verse 2? What's the first thing she does? She goes and she tells Peter and John. What do we know about Peter and John? Peter and John are probably, they were, Peter, John, and James were probably the three closest to Jesus out of all the disciples. And then, and then John was probably the closest out of the, out of the three that were close to Jesus. And so that's the first thing that she did. She went and she told them, and they were, they were predominantly the leaders among the disciples. And so she goes and she tells them the first thing, and she's really excited. Now, what John leaves out, what the other gospels don't, uh, what the other gospels talk about is, is that Mary probably had talked to the <coughs> angels prior to this. That she had talked, she leaves out information about the angels, and she so she goes and she does. And does what? And she tells Peter and James. Uh, and she tells she tells Peter and John. She gives them all this information and tells them, "We have seen Jesus. We have seen the risen Christ. We have seen him." Oh, no, 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 he's not there. The tomb is empty. And so what they, they couldn't do. Peter and John couldn't wait. So what do they do? They come running. And here they are running together, John and Peter. John and Peter had come running. And that's the, that's the second encounter. Mary was so excited, her first response was, well, I've got go to go, go tell Peter and, jo uh, Peter and John that Jesus has risen. Jesus, well, we don't know where he is. We've got to go find his body. But we've got go, we to go tell him. That was her first response. And then she goes and tells Peter and, 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 and John. And then what's their response? They come they come running there. And then John outruns, first they were running together, but then John outruns Peter and gets to the tomb first. And he goes and he sees a stone rolled away and he looks inside. And he looks inside and he sees, where, where, uh, you know, and he's looking around, he doesn't see anything there. He sees, he sees the grave cloth. He sees a cloth uh, there, but doesn't see Jesus. And then, but Peter goes automatically in. And then it goes on with John, and it says that as he sees the linen wrappings, linen wrap, wrappings, but he doesn't go in. And then Peter arrives after John and goes in the tomb and sees the linen wrappings and the face cloth lying separately by itself. John entered the empty tomb. And Peter, and, and after Peter, and what, did, and what does we say about John? What does it say about John? And this is in verse, uh, this is ver verses six and seven. And it says, and he saw and believed. The idea there be to believe is to be 
means persuaded in the truthfulness of who Christ is. What Jesus came to do, his death and his resurrection. So John saw, the tomb was empty, he saw the cloth there, and he believed. He was persuaded in his heart. He didn't fully understand, as we're going to find out, but he believed in his heart about what Jesus said. Even though he didn't understand, he still believed. And let's go on here. And it says, um, it says they did not, and it says, and, and it goes on here, and it says, for as yet they did not understand, verse 9, the scripture, that he must rise again from the dead. They didn't, Jesus had spoken about that, but they didn't fully understand and comprehend what that meant. But even though, but it doesn't say about Peter that Peter believed. All it says is that it says John believed, but they didn't understand what Jesus said. So, John still believed, but he didn't understand. Peter didn't understand, but Peter had, at this point, had not yet believed. Peter needed physical, Peter needed physical proof. Peter needed physical stuff. And we're going to find out next week about that. But we see that you don't necessarily have to have proof in order to believe. John just said, I don't understand it, I don't know what it's about, but it says that he still believed in his heart about who Jesus is. And often it says um, that we have to have proof in order to believe. And, and, and that's not always, for some people, yes, they need proof. But other people, they hear it, and they see it, and then that's it. And they believe in their heart. Well then, let's go on here. Let's look at uh, let's look at Mary's second reaction, Mary's second response to the empty tomb and her encounter with Jesus, verses 11 through 18. Mary had come back to the tomb and was standing outside there weeping. She stoops and looks in. Why was she weeping? First of all, she had come back after she went and go told Peter and John. And she comes back while Peter and John are in the tomb, and Peter and John leave. And so she's standing outside, weeping out of the tomb. And she's weeping because she's sad because the one she loved, her master, had died. And she wanted, what, 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 what could she do? What could she do? What could she do? What could she do? And so she was weeping. And so what happens? And then she encounters someone, and she sees the two angels, one at the head and one at the feet of where Jesus' body was. And what does the angel say to her? Why are you weeping? It's significant that there's two angels. Because in the Jewish law, uh, a fact was established on the witness of two tests, uh, uh, two witnesses. Te a truth was established on the, the witness of two witnesses, on the testimony of two witnesses. So here are two angels in white, signifying purity. And what do they say? And, they, and then what do they say? They say, they know what Mary's there for. They know that Mary is weeping because her master was taken away and they want to know where she wants to go prepare his body for him. She sees the angel, and the angel says, Why are you weeping? Take it away, my Lord. I don't know where they have laid him. Indicates the great love that she had for Jesus. Mary had a great affection for Jesus. There was a relationship there. But now, as we're going to find out, that relationship is going to change. It's going to change. And we're going to see that. It says, uh, let's, let's go on here in verse 13 and, and verse 14. She turns around and she sees Jesus standing there. But she didn't recognize him. Apparently, Jesus' whole figure, his whole countenance, his whole character, his whole person had changed. 
and she didn't recognize him. She didn't understand that this was the one whom she loved. This was the one whom she had desired and longed for. The one who changed her life. The one who made her into a different person. The one who was an adulteress into a, 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 a one who would follow Jesus with all of her heart. And so she went and she, and she talks to him as if, you know, he's a stranger. And all the while, someone that she's very close with. And Jesus a answers her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Jesus knew, whom are you seeking? She thinks he's the gardener. <coughs> and she thinks he is the one who's going to tell her where the body is. Because he's the one who takes care of the, the, the tomb. Not realizing that it's Jesus all along. Where have you laid him? I want to go take care of him. Please, will you tell me? Please, will you tell me? And Jesus is, is uh, and, but Jesus says, woman. And he's, he talks to her in a tone that is as if it's a stranger. In a kind tone, in a gracious tone, as a, a tone of one who is a stranger talking to another stranger. Not one who is familiar. Saying, woman. And then, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? And Jesus already knew the answer. He wasn't looking like he was looking for answers. But he wanted Mary to articulate what was already in her heart. What was already there. For her, sometimes to verbally articulate what's in your heart makes you fully understand what's going, really going on in your heart anyway. So the reality is, is that Jesus wasn't looking for the answer, but he wanted Mary to understand what she was asking for. And he wanted Mary to understand what she was really looking for. And so we go on here, and she says, um, she, says uh, she couldn't articulate what was in her heart. And then we go on here, in verse, and it's in verse 15, she in her heart, in her heart thought he was a gardener. If you carry him away, tell him, take him away, put him in a burial spot for rest so that I can prepare his body. All out of love and respect because she, her heart was sorrowful. Then she goes on and says, and then something changes here. She, all she wanted to do was just to bury his body. She's asking this man here, this gardener, where can I go so I can prepare him properly? And then he says something that makes all the difference in the world. He says her name. What does that signify? It signifies relationship. He says it in a tone that she knew and that she recognized. Yes. Mary. Mary. In other words, Mary had that close relationship with Jesus before. All that he had done for her. And that she followed him closely with all of her heart. And she recognized that tone of voice. Even though she may have not recognized his form initially. She recognized the tone. And in relationship, it's so important when you know someone else's name. Especially when you've met them before and you've had a relationship with them. And you know that tone. And you know that tone and that, that voice which indicates there's a closeness in a relationship. Tone indicates a lot. can say a lot. Especially when you say your name. I remember, and this was something that was really important to me, but made a lot of sense, was when I was, I was growing up and I had moved out of my house, and again, I'm the youngest of ten. And I, I would call my parents, and I would just talk to them on the phone every so often. And there's ten of us. And I would call up and say, and my mom would pick up the phone and say, Hi, Mom. I was like, oh, John. She knew my tone. She knew my voice. She knew my tone. Why? 
because we had a relationship all those years. There was a close relationship. There was a fondness there. John, it's you. And what Mary recognized was Jesus was saying, Mary, Mary. And all of a sudden, Mary's ears perked up, her eyes perked up, and her whole countenance changed. And then she recognized Jesus. Even though his form had changed, maybe she hadn't, he was in his glorified, he was in, his, in, his, in the glorious state here at this point. He recognized, he knew her, he spoke her name. It was about relationship. And what did she say to him? Rabboni, which is teacher in Hebrew. And what they did back then, and the history was, is that um, the, 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 uh, the students would follow the rabbi. And he would, and wherever the rabbi went, that's where the teacher, students went. And when the rabbi taught, that's where the students would learn under them. Like a big teacher back then, uh, at that time was Gamaliel. He was just a big uh, rabbinical teacher back then. And so he had a big following. And so, and normally women weren't really allowed to follow in that type of setting. Because women didn't have a, a, a role, didn't have a high role back in that culture, in that society. They didn't treat women very well. They really didn't. But for Jesus to allow women to also be a part of his following was a big deal. And that's what made a big difference for Mary. Here, not only was she a notorious person that had obvious notorious sin, but also she was a woman, and that Jesus even allowed her to even sit under him and to follow him. And so she cried out in her voice, Rabboni, in other words, my teacher. The one that she was close to, the one she looked up to. Think about this. And um, you ever have a favorite teacher in school? Think about that. Or a favorite person that you just spent a lot of time with. And you looked up to that person. You gained a lot. You you gained they you gained a lot of uh, information from them. I remember people in my own life where I would sit under them and I would you know and they would teach me and they would help me. And I remember them. And I just had a, I had a close relationship with them. And I could, I could just say their name. You know, and because it, it was out of a close relationship. They, they spending time with me. They spending and doing things with me. And, and as a result, I could speak their name in a fond way. And that's what Mary was doing. Because she had a fond relationship. Jesus. And so she goes on here. And what's the first thing that Mary does? Give her a good old hug around the legs. Because that's what she's done before. That's what she has done before. She had a close relationship with Jesus. But that's changed. What does Jesus say? Stop clinging to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Uh, Mary can believe and adore him as an exalted, but not, she must ex not be expected to be familiar with him for, as formerly, because he's holy. In other words, the relationship has changed. Here he was, her teacher. He was a human, uh, God and a man in human form. But now that he is, he's risen, he's going to be going to the Father. He's in a holy state. And she cannot stop clinging to me. Not that he was trying to push her away by any means. But he's in a holy state, in a holy form, that she couldn't really hold on to him like that. But also in the sense that there was an urgency there. But go and tell the other disciples. And she gives him to my brethren. 
and tell them. You hear what he calls them? My brethren. If you look at if you look at verses, if you look at verse 18. Uh, and to the disciples. And look at stuff. And what is it? And what does he say? But go to my brethren and tell them. There's an urgency. There's a good news there. He gives her specific instructions. Go. 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 She saw Jesus. She saw the risen Christ. And what does he tell her? Go. Go. Go and tell them. And he gives her a specific message. So there's two parts here. Number one is, is that there's a relationship. And that relationship is restored, but it's restored in a different way. And then it goes on here, and then he says, go, and he has a message. And it says, in verse 17, it says, I ascend to my Father and your Father, and my God and your God. His relationship with his Father was now theirs. As a child to a parent, their relationship is now with the Father. Think about that. I go, I go, I, I go to my my father and your father, my God and your God. See how the relationship has changed. What was the purpose of Jesus coming? The purpose of Jesus coming was to reestablish a relationship with His creation, man, with God the Father. And so the purpose of the resurrection was so that Jesus could die for our sins, which separated, which separated people from God. And so, and, and so he died, he shed his blood, and his body was broken, laid in a tomb, and he rose again in victory. So now mankind can be forgiven of their sin, the very sin that separated them from God. And now man, what Jesus was saying was, man can now have a relationship with God. Like Mary had a relationship with Jesus here on earth, now she can have a relationship, except on a different plane, with Jesus, but also with whom? With God the Father. As a father. As a good father. Sometimes we sing a song here. Um, it's called, Good, Good Father. That's who you are. And so that relationship, Jesus ushers in through the resurrection and gives Mary the message, go and tell him, I go to my father and whose father? Your father. So a whole new relationship. The Jews never understood, never knew God as father. They knew him as God, but they never knew him as a father. Never knew that. That relationship wasn't there. And it's an intimate relationship that is with that a child can only have with a father. A special relationship. And now in a close relationship, in an intimate relationship that a child has with their father. And now that was ushered in because of Jesus dying on the cross and rising again. Man can now have a relationship with God as their father. But also, not only is it God their father, but he, he not only is a God, uh, Jesus was God, Jesus, God was Jesus' father, father. Jesus, the father was Jesus' father, but he was also his God. And it says, not only was he his God, but he was their God as well. And that was the message. Not only could God be your father, but he's your God as well. In other words, you have that close relationship, but also that holy relationship. In other words, there's that holiness that's there. He is God. He is God. And there is no one else but him. Yes. And so Jesus ushers in that relationship for the disciples. That's the message you are going to do. Now you can have a relationship as, with the Father as Father, and you can go have a relationship with God as God. 
That's what I've come to do. Now go and tell them. And that's the gospel. That is the very gospel. What does Mary do? And Mary goes, um, Mary went and announced to the disciples, I've seen the Lord. In other words, she saw him. It's true. He said these things to her. Mary went right away. That's the first thing she did. She just told her to go. She went. She was obedient. Why? Because of what happened. There was a relationship that was there. And now the relationship has been established. And Mary went in obedience. And she told the disciples, it says in verse 18, it says, Mary Magdalene came announcing to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he said these things to her. So, the reality is, is that Jesus, the relevance, getting back to our original question, the relevance of the empty tomb and the resurrection of Jesus is this. He came to forgive us of our sin so that we, our sin could be washed away through the precious blood of Jesus and his broken body. Because it says without the shedding of blood, it says in the Old Testament, Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. So Jesus being that perfect sacrifice, he was sinless without, he was God come in the flesh, he was sinless without any sin in his life, came and gave himself willingly to be the propitiation or the payment for our sin so we could be forgiven and that we could enter into that relationship with God as Father and as God. And so when he rose from the grave, the victory was won. And the reality is, is that he can hear us call our name. And he can hear us, we can hear him call our name. We can hear him call our name. We can hear him call our name. I'll give you another example. The Lord is just so neat about this. The scriptures... I know, I, and I'm big about relevance of, of Scripture and uh, relationship with Jesus. I remember sitting at my desk at work one day. This was a while, long, long, long time ago. But I remember sitting at my desk, and I remember, I don't know what I was thinking about, but he said, I remember I hear, I hear this distinct voice in my heart today. Son, I love you. Now, my dad was still alive at the time. So it wasn't my dad speaking. It was God the Father. He was saying, son. Meaning that this, that the relationship was, he was saying, I know you. I'm calling you son. I'm calling you son. I know you, and this is my relationship that I have with you. And that's the very thing he's calling each one of us into, is that relationship with the very living God, where he calls us by name. He calls us by name. He calls us by name. And that's what he's doing today. He's calling us by name. And... That's what the cross is about. If you do not Jesus, that's what the resurrection is about. If you know not Jesus, call upon him today and say, Jesus, please forgive me of my sin. I know that my sin separates me from you and having a relationship with you. Please forgive me and show me mercy. Please come into my life and enter into my life so that I can know you I can hear you, I can, I can have a relationship with you, where I know you and you know me. And I can call out your name. I want to take a moment now, and I want to pray. If you know not Christ, let's take a moment and let's pray. And pray a simple prayer. Let's pray, pray it like this. It says, Father, I know that I've sinned against you. I know that I've hurt you in many ways. Please forgive me. Please cleanse me of my sin. And please wash me with your blood, Jesus. 
Please come into my life, take control of my life, and be the Lord and Master of my life. I give you full control. And I thank you, Jesus. And I, lo I love you and I'll trust you. And I'll follow you. In your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. And if those of us who do know Jesus, want that deeper relationship like Mary had, where they know where he speaks your name, and you automatically recognize his voice. If Mary hadn't had a relationship with Jesus, when Jesus spoke her name, she wouldn't have recognized, she wouldn't have recognized his voice. But because there was a closeness there, Already, she recognized it. And God wants to bring us into that same type of relationship in our own lives with God. Where all He has to do is to speak our name and we automatically recognize it. Where we know His close fellowship, we know a close relationship, we know when He speaks, we know when He tells us to do something, we know when He is in our presence, we know when He's in our midst. But that comes by relationship. Let's pray a prayer and ask Jesus, uh, help me to help us to come closer with Him in our relationship. With him. Jesus, uh, I thank you, Jesus, that uh, I do know you. Help us, help me, Jesus, to know you more. Help me know you closer. Help me to love you, Father. Help me to love you and help me to know you as my Father. Help me to know you as my God, in a deeper way. Help me, Jesus. I want to know you more. I want to be close with you. I want to love you even more and more and more. Change me, make me, mold me into the person that you want me to be. Help me, Jesus. And I thank you and love you. In Jesus' name. Amen. If you look at uh, Isaiah 53, verse 9, and it talks about, I'm not going to turn there, but it talks about that even in death, he was among the wealthy. Joseph of Arimathea was one of the Sanhedrin, which was a Jewish leader, but he was an extremely, extremely, extremely wealthy man. But he was a follower of Christ as well. And think about that. Again, another scripture being fulfilled. Even though Jesus was not a wealthy man, he was buried in a wealthy man's tomb. A tomb that no one had ever been laid in before. A, tomb, a tomb that was right in the rear, right here, the place where Jesus was How convenient was that? No, it's not convenient, but it was something that God had planned and something God had planned. Think about that. Again, all those details.